I want to thank uh, the Strategy as Practices group for inviting me to be the speaker uh, today. Um, I want to acknowledge Rajiv, silver tongue devil that he is, uh, in talking me into doing this, and I've been looking forward to it ever since. And um, I want to acknowledge uh, Ann Langley. Ann, why don't you stand up so that people, if they don't connect the face with the name, this is Ann Langley. Let me embarrass Ann a little bit. Uh, what you might not know is that Ann was inducted into the Academy of Management Fellows last night. So that's quite a signal <laughs> career on uh, I want to comment on this complication too. Um, a little quick story, and I'm a storyteller, so get used to it. Um, I, I was on the program for the Academy meeting last year, as David Oliver would tell you here, um, and I wasn't able to come at the last minute, so I phoned it in. I made a video, which was played at the Academy, it turned out to be a better forum than a live format because it made a record that was scripted. And if you know me, I'm quite scattered and random, so I go off on tangents. So I'm better if I script something. And then I discovered in our studio, the script that I wrote crawled across the screen as I read it with some animation and sent that in and it was postable and everything worked and I thought, cool, I'm going to do that again for this year. So I made up a presentation that was designed for a teleprompter, <laughs> presidential style. Uh, and then I was operating on the whole assumption that I would be reading my own script with feeling uh, today when I was informed last night, uh, sorry, there is no such thing as a teleprompter in this building. So I had to skip everything this morning and convert everything to slides. So my apologies for having to use classic PowerPoint and you should forgive me if they look semi haphazard. So let me, let me start in here uh, if I could, but apparently I can't because, what sure. I, sure. yeah, should. Ah, all right. It does work. So let's go back to that one. Yeah, you can just press this for forward. That so for yeah. forward, no wonder. It's upside down. Can I just get one second? Oh, sorry. Uh, you see these these cards, right? Uh, you can write questions and then submit to David, David Oliver, David, uh, and at the end of Denny's talk, and also at the end of Anne's uh, discussion. Sorry. Thank you. So feel free to ask whatever you got. Uh, if you if you know about me and my family, I have an answer for everything. If even if I have to make it up and I'm good at making stuff up. So uh, here was my conundrum. Um, what, uh, what would be uh, um, of most interesting and useful for me to talk about as a quasi-stranger for the SAP group? Now, I guess I've been aware of the group for some time, aware of some of the stuff that I've done has had some influence on the group, but I have not been an intimate member of the group. So I thought, what, what, would, what would be most useful to do? Should I uh, perhaps pontificate about uh, what would make uh, SAP more effective? Nah, that sounds far too pretentious for one thing and presumptuous, and, and I've discovered that another, quite a number of members of this group have already written about that in the literature, so good. Uh, I'm absolved from the need for that. Should I suggest directions for future research? Maybe. I got some possibilities, but then I've discovered that's also been handled pretty well. So, uh, or should I just play to my strengths and talk about what I know? Yeah, that's the ticket. Let's feel comfortable here. So let's talk methodology. <laughs> oh Lord, <laughs> God help us all. Are we really going to talk about methodology? Uh, and worse than that, if we're going to talk about methodology, we got to first talk about philosophy of science. And now I can look around the room and see a lot of people whose eyes are beginning to glaze over and some people ready to just skip out. 
So let me see if I can make this uh, arcane topic, which can be oh so boring, um, a little bit more lively and make it relevant to what, uh, to what you do. So let's start here. Let's start with some personal background um, because, um, and I wouldn't otherwise do this, except that I, I think it, uh, it, it does have direct relevance to why I'm passionate about uh, a, an approach to doing research. And, and uh, just as a little feed forward, um, I'm going to talk mainly about the development of a qualitative methodology, a rigorous, systematic, qualitative methodology, and what's behind all of that. Now, I fully recognize that the SAP group, uh, I've read the website and, and talked to quite a few members, is quite inclusive about everything whether it's theories or methodological practices, or I don't know if you really mean it, because when I look at the research, I see an awful lot of qualitative methodology. Um, so, and I talked to a few people and they said, mm, I, think, I think that group will not resent uh, spending um, 40 minutes or so on discussions of qualitative methodology, so I'm gonna try it. And I'm going to try it uh, to at least give you a sense uh, of the uh, of the what's behind the scenes when we talk about studying strategy as practice. Um, so, my background is that I was trained as an engineer. I was a classic engineer. I walked like an engineer, talked like an engineer, thought like an engineer. Engineering systems made sense to me. And I went to work first as an engineer for Boeing Aerospace during the, uh, during the Apollo lunar programs. And yes, I know that as soon as I say that, I'm dating myself. Now you can look at this guy and say, eh, that's really an old fart in the field up there, isn't it? Because the Apollo program dates from the late 60s and the early 70s. But it was quite useful uh, for me to understand how an engineering organization worked. Although there was not a lot of concern about organization and organizing and organizational behavior at Boeing Aerospace. We had a mission. The mission pretty well specified what we needed to do and how quickly and how we all interacted. Putting a man on a moon is no, a moon is no small feat. So it didn't take a lot to figure out the organizational system at Boeing Aerospace. Then I went back to school, got my MBA, and went to work for Ford Motor Company. I had great aspirations of working on the racing team. I'm a car guy, love fast cars. So I went to Ford to work on the racing team. At the very month that they shut down the racing program. So there went that dream. So I ended up being, as some of you may know, the recall coordinator at Ford Motor Company and became infamous as a result. We won't go into that story today because I was the guy in charge of the Pinto fires case, uh, which may ring some bells with you. Um, now, but especially the forward experience uh, led me to see organizations as the complex, difficult to manage, take on a life of their own, gotta take an action now, living entities that they were. And that's where I think it ought to resonate with this group, because I see your mission in life, professional life, as chasing down that stuff. How do we understand what those managers who've got to make a decision and take an action actually have to do? Now, then I moved back into academia. I spent only three years at Ford and decided I'd rather do this and I've been doing this now for 40 years, um, where I discovered that the models for understanding organizations were based on physical science theory and research. Great. The, the metaphor of the time, and is still with us, is organization as machine. Well, for a guy who was formerly an engineer, that's beautiful. I get it. I can understand systems that work like engineering systems, um, but it didn't actually match up very well with 
what I had experienced, especially at Ford Motor Company. So it turned out to be a pretty limited way of understanding, and I'll, I'll return to this in a second. Um, now here comes the, uh, the academies alert. Although I got a feeling for this group, these are not strange terms. I wanna talk a little bit about ontology, epistemology, methodology, because they're like a cascade to me. Uh, ontology is, has everything to do with the nature of the beast that we study. What assumptions do we make about organization, organizing, that was, would facilitate our epistemologies? How do we know or can we know about this beast that we're studying? And that flows more or less, you should forgive the term, naturally into methodologies. What techniques, tactics, methods do we actually use to study this beast? Now, uh, another thing you ought to know about me, especially as it relates to this, is that I'm an idealist. I'll tell you a little story about being an idealist. It's a true story, too. Uh, I once uh, visited my old major professor some years after I'd been out of uh, school, and um, while I was in his office, he got a call from another professor that I had known, a guy by the name of John Lee. My major professor was Bill Hodge. And uh, Bill said, uh, guess who's in my office? And John Lee, completely mysterious to him, said, how the hell could I guess that, Bill? Why don't you give me a hint? And Hodge said, who's the most idealistic person you know? And John Lee said, Danny Joya can't be in your office, can he? I was. And to this day, I remain an idealist about organizations and their role in society. But I'm not just any old idealist. I refer to myself as a pragmatic idealist. Things are based on ideals, principles, but they gotta work in practice. And that's where our focus ought to be. Um, and that probably is my strongest connection uh, to SAP, because conceptual relevance matters to me. Now, uh, let me go somewhere else as, as a little further um, uh, bit of background. Here's a quote from a, um, a chapter I wrote uh, for Peter Frost and uh, Ralph Stebline some years ago. Um, when he was trying to ask a few of us in the field how we went about renewing ourselves. I thought it was a pretty pretentious mission or um, assignment to be given. But I thought about it, and I wrote an article called A Renaissance Self, with the implication being how do you renew yourself. I'm a grounded theorist, and here's the phrase I made up that I kind of like. I pick people's brains for a living. It's what I do. I try to figure out how they make sense of their organizational experience, and then I write analytical narratives that try to capture what I think they know. Now think about that for a second. Because although I would not say that I'm up on SAP work, that that I have read so far tells me there's a lot of this kind of stuff going on in there. So let's pick that apart. Let's pick apart that self-description because it tells you a lot about ontology, epistemology, and methodology all wrapped up into a, a single statement. Um, let's go back to the Ford and Boeing experiences. They're both engineering organizations, right? That's what they do. Boeing Aerospace built space vehicles. Ford Motor Company built road vehicles. Boeing looked for all the world like an engineering organization. Ford did not. If you could describe Boeing, it was indeed an engineering system mapped to an organization. To describe Ford that way, you'd miss it completely. Ford is better described as a social system. And I like to think of it this way. If you want to read the organization chart, it only helps a little bit. It provides only a rough roadmap for where you want to be. It tells you nothing about how to get there. To you know how to get there, you don't take the roads, you take the back alleys. 
because things work completely different. So I describe forward as a social system more than an engineering system. But to understand each of these organizations, you had to understand meaning, and the study of meaning was practically immune to the methods of the social science or the, of the physical sciences, the techniques of the scientific method. So what to do? More importantly here, as far as the philosophical background goes, you had to understand process and practice, how things actually got done. I suddenly had this minor revelation while I'm standing here that I'm preaching to the choir. Um, and it feels a little strange, but uh, let me press on regardless here. To me, the most important recognition in social and organization study the most important or, uh, realization is that much of the world with which we deal is essentially socially constructed. So we need to understand how people construct the reality they deal with. Now, I don't know, maybe, maybe I'm not the sharpest tool in the box, but this one, this one hit me hard, especially, maybe especially, because I was trained as an engineer. When this came down, it was a big revelation. It really was profound. And I know we're pretty cavalier about using the word profound, but this one was a biggie for me. And it changed the way I had to think about organizations. So let's think about what that means to say it's socially constructed. Now, let me be a little bit mm, uh, colloquial about it. This is a world where, where people make stuff up and come to consensually agree on the made up stuff as the reality which, which, with which they will deal. This is a world in which you can't just count stuff, which again is a real jolt for an engineer. And I put up a little quote here, which seems to be making the rounds in our field more frequently lately. Not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. You've seen this one, yes? Most of the time when you see it, it's attributed to Albert Einstein. Einstein didn't say that. A sociologist by the name of William Bruce Cameron actually said that. So there, there's your, there's your tidbit for the day. If you're looking for tidbits to walk out of here with, there's one for you. Um, Another quick sidebar. I'm sort of on a personal campaign uh, to stamp out the use of physical science metaphors to describe social science phenomena. I ain't making much headway, mind you, but I'm trying hard. Um, and, and just as an example, I, I, it's driving me nuts. Have you noticed how often we use the word mechanisms in our literature? Why? Every time we're talking about mechanisms, we're either talking about processes, which is what we folks do, or we're talking about factors. Either one of them is a better metaphor than mechanisms. Oh, I see if I can get my cord here. I double checked the, uh, the uh, program for today, but I, I couldn't help but notice that the program for the fellows meeting last night has a whole bunch of gears on it. Yuck. Gears. Why would we ever use mechanical gears to display a visual representation of the processes that we're trying to study? Is it just default? Is it just easy? Must be. But you know, it reminds me of this project that the women of the world are on, which I wholeheartedly agree with, that we need to quit using he as, and him as the default for everything. Now, you may have noticed a lot of writings where we have this little footnote. Look, folks, it's too awkward to continually use he and she and him and her in the sentences, so we either make up pronouns or we put the footnote in it says, we'll just use he as a default, but let's please all understand that we also mean she at the same time. And of course, the feminine view says, every time you do that, 
it legitimates the existing power structure. Well, every time we do this and accept mechanisms as a substitute for processes, we're just le legitimizing an inappropriate way of understanding the beast we're trying to study. Sorry, I'm getting exercised. I need to settle down a little bit. I will here directly. Um, I guess my conclusion was that something seems to be hanging us up in gaining a deeper understanding or knowledge of organizational dynamics. And, and what might that thing be? As I've already laid the groundwork for, that thing would be we need to understand more about process. And I want to thank Anne again. She beat most of us to the punch here with a wonderful 1999 article on the study of process. Uh, to focus more on the means by which organiz organization members go about constructing and understanding uh, their experience. So what, what assumptions should we make to do that? Well, again, you should forgive me. Let me introduce another bit of academies. I call these people knowledgeable agents. Now, you know, frankly, when I came up through a PhD program, we'd see the, the label S for subject in all these experimental, psychological experimental works that we would use as our research base. And then that sort of disappeared. But um, we also use the term frequently agent in our literature, and we know what that means, but it sounds pretty stilted. So I want to apologize for coining the, uh, the term knowledgeable agent, but I haven't found a better one yet because it means something significant to me, and I would think it means something significant to you who are trying to study these people. What do I mean by referring to the people I study as knowledgeable agents? Well, this may seem obvious to you. It's not obvious to the rest of the field. People who inform on their experience know quite well what they're trying to accomplish, can explain to us what they are trying to do, how they are trying to do it, and post, perhaps most importantly, why they are trying to do. They are not, in any sense, Garfinkel's cultural dopes. These are knowledgeable people. And when you go talk to them, they can explain to you just how knowledgeable they are. Um, and it allows them to give an account of their experience in their terms, not ours. Let me tell you a little story about how this came home strong to me. It's from one of the earlier research projects. Somehow or other, I, I got it in advance enough to say, we were studying strategy making in academia. Now, at the time we were doing this, late 80s, early 90s, strategic thinking was not part of the academic canon. Oh, we taught it. We just didn't do it. But the top management team I was studying was trying to do just that. Now, we know strategy, right? I mean, it's part of our normal lexicon now that we talk in terms of strategic managers thinking about issues in categories of threats or opportunities. Every dummy knows that, right? What if we suspend that assumption? So we designed interview protocols that never once used either one of those terms. And you know what? In all those interviews, over all those months, never once did those informants use the terms that we academics think are universal, threats and opportunities. They, term, they talked in terms of issues as either strategic or political, not threats and opportunities. Now, I don't know, maybe it's more impressive to me than it is to you, but when I think about that, I go, there's a lesson in that for me. Quit assuming that your theoretical language maps onto their experience. Maybe it doesn't. Um, so if we adopt the assumption that these people are knowledgeable agents, then it tends to give voice to them. It makes us as researchers into glorified reporters. Now, you may think that's insulting. 
We're some of the brightest people on the planet, aren't we? Why should we want to be remanded to a role where we're glorified reporters, where our job is mainly to report what these people have told us? Well, there's, there's some real advantages hidden in there in giving them voice like this. And furthermore, we're not really dummies either. We also are knowledgeable agents because we can think theoretically. We'll get our chance, but first, as a matter of principle, philosophical principle, it's important to give voice to the informants and record their articulation of their experience before you impose our theoretical frameworks on top of it. So, uh, reporting both voices in tandem gives a multifaceted view, but it's based on the informant's experience, not our theoretical work. And I just now noticed that the bottom line of all these is missing, that's all right. Um, let me see, I think I better skip this little story or I'm sure people like storytelling. That's part, of, that's part of the beauty of what we do in qualitative research. Anyway, we get to tell a story. It's an analytical story, but it's a story, and uh, we're all storytellers. So, uh, I'll, I'll, well, now that I've put it up there, I can't skip it, can I? <laughs> nope. <laughs> okay, so I'll tell you. My first interpretive qualitative research project, we worked our tuchuses off to get it right. We were religious about analyzing these interviews, and we puffed ourselves up proudly when we went to show, as a member checking kind of thing, to the informants what our analysis had generated. And we thought, boy, will they be impressed at how thorough we were. And the response we got was, oh, you guys. <laughs> You know, yeah, you've been recording all this stuff and all these meetings and stuff. The real decisions are being made behind the scenes in what we call the kitchen cabinet. You don't even know about that, do you? Um, no. So we had to wheedle our invitation to the kitchen cabinet meetings before we understand what strategy really was taking place. So you always have to be careful of the fact of fiction, as John Van Manen calls it in ethnographic research. Oh my, I shouldn't have done this. Um, if you're interested in this methodology that I'm talking about, it's published um, in um, Organization Research Methods in 2013, I think. Um, it's Joya uh, Corley and Hamilton. Um, so here's the opening paragraph to that piece, which I think is a lot of people have glommed on to because it looks like an entree into uh, at least an avenue, avenue into facilitating how I go about my own work. What does it take to imbue an inductive study with qualitative rigor while still retaining the creative revelatory potential for generating new concepts and ideas uh, for which such studies are best known? Now there's a lot going on in there. Okay? We want to maintain the revelatory potential but we also want to have it be rigorous. In some sense, whatever that word might mean, at least systematic. How can inductive researchers apply systematic, conceptual, and analytical discipline that leads to credible interpretations of data and also helps to convince readers that the conclusions are plausible and defensible? <sighs> I think I'm going to trust in my sense here that th that statement, as articulate as it might, like, might look, because I spent some time to create it, re might resonate with you because I was trying to capture the angst that I was experiencing 20 years ago about how to do this in a way that was true to the informants and yet would be seen as, this is an image issue, would be seen as credible by the gatekeepers in the field. Now that's a problem most of us have with trying to publish, and I'll get there in a second. But we're all looking for a way to convince, rhetorically or database. 
And so in, in, a, in a lot of ways, both of those rationales, how do I develop a method that guides the research and how do I convince the readers of the research report that I know what I'm talking about and that I got something useful to say? My answer, devise an approach that encourages discovery, shows evidence for assertions to address the concern that qualitative research too often makes grandiose assertions on the basis of pretty thin evidence. We're guilty of doing that too often which is why you constantly get editors exhorting us to show the evidence and demonstrate that the evidence is connected to your grandiose assertions. That it accounts for both a first order, that's adequate at the level of meaning of the informant, and a second order understanding adequate at the level of meaning of us, the researchers. Oh, I left myself a little note here. I even put it in yellow so that I wouldn't miss it. I've heard some people talking about third order understanding. I don't know what that is. I think, I think people read my, my works and they see this first order. Okay, I get it. That's the people doing the work. They're talking. And I see the second order themes and my goodness, there look like 12 of them. That's a lot to grasp. And then there's this theoretical dimension column. Oh, some people label that as third order. No, it isn't. Third order is sort of like, you have to invoke God if you want to get third order. <laughs> some understanding at some omniscient level, that ain't us, folks. So second order theoretical dimensions is just a distillation of the themes, that's all. Um, in addition, it produces a data structure. That shows the data to theory connections. I put my little mantra up there. You got no data structure, you got nothing. Now I don't really mean it. Some people take me literally. I don't really mean it. And if anything, data structures are becoming a little too common in our literature, and I'm being taken to task for it. Um, all I'm saying with that is metaphorical. And the metaphorical part is make sure you have a demonstrable basis of evidence for your assertions. In my case, I always use a data structure. And the data structure generates the dynamic grounded process model. And let me cite uh, Rajiv's wonderful work on that, uh, which, by the way, is a good piece of SAP work as well, where the grounded process model, the data structure, let me use two metaphors for you. The data structure is a static picture. The grounded model converts that picture into a movie. If you like another analogy, if the data structure is the anatomy, the grounded model is the physiology. To me, they operate in tandem. I can't do one without the other. So when editors ask me to get rid of the data structure, please, I'm lost. I don't know how to do that. I mean, it, it, it's not honest if I don't report the, the data structure. All right, let me, uh, how am I doing, Rajiv? Uh, we've got about five minutes, five, ten minutes. That's it? What? Go ahead. <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> Indian ritual time. I time is a continuum. <laughs> All right. Um, let me talk a little bit about, I think, the issues. I see a lot of young folks in here. Of course, everybody's young compared to me these days. But um, <laughs> I'm sure the concern in the group is with, and, I, and, and, and I, here's what I love about academia. I'm always surrounded by bright people. You know, Everybody in the room is a bright person. So why in the hell is it so hard to publish our ideas? Why can't we convince these godforsaken reviewers that we're brilliant? And we have something to say. 
So I think we all want to know about how to convince when we're doing SAP type work, and that's its own little corner of the world as well. Um, with its ever increasing focus on contribution to theory, I'm quite confident that nobody in the room has failed to see that term in uh, an editor's letter, right? The field is headed for increasingly ar uh, the arcane, the increasingly arcane. Uh, but that's why this group's work is important, uh, as it focuses on what managers actually do and theorizes about that. But we got to publish this work in visible places. So let's talk about what it might take to do that. Let's be honest here. And I, I do want to, I want to close with this, but I want to make an observation, as I think that most of you know, that still the overwhelming majority of the work in our field is quantitative. And the gatekeepers are quantitatively trained. Um, that pre presents a particular problem. Uh, they are looking for normal looking papers, typically characterized by deductive thinking, hypothesis testing, quantitative data displays, results, not findings, by the way. I don't have any results sections. My sections are labeled as finding sections because I'm not testing hypotheses. Um, qualitative interpretive papers are aimed at plausible, this is a key phrase to me, plausible, defensible explanations, not this is the right answer explanations. Now, if you're a social constructionist, as I am, that statement makes sense to you. Most of the field is looking for the right answer. We're looking for plausible, defensible explanations with the full recognition that there could be multiple effective answers, right? Nonetheless, data to theory demonstrations um, are important. And, and I left myself another little note here. One of the early authors or PhD students I was working with was just incensed when the reviewers came back and said, we want to see more evidence. More evidence. I was there. I was the ethnographer. I saw it. I know it. And I'm disappointed. That's a mild term that they don't believe me. That's never going to fly. Just because you were there does not make it right. You've got to demonstrate where your assertions come from. So um, let, me, let me tell you my own personal story, because I've got a feeling it's going to resonate with yours, and I'll try to be brief here. Um, one of the early studies uh, was a case study. It's the one that eventually became the sense-making, sense-giving paper in SMJ back in 91, dating myself again. Um, and, and I had become an interpretivist by then. Uh, and I left myself a little note here. I got to tell you about Barbara Gray, one of my former colleagues experienced Barbara Gray. She wants to, now this thing too smart, mind you, she sent a case study to JAP, Journal of Applied Psychology. Anybody here read JAP? You ever seen a case study in JAP? No, you have not. Nonetheless, Barbara, quite the assertive woman, sent a case study to JAP. For her trouble, she got a one-line, two-sentence review. This is a case study. JAP does not publish case studies. Please go away. That part was left unsaid. Um, SMJ had not, pre they had published a few case studies before but they, and to my knowledge, had never published an interpretive study, one that was giving ultimate voice to the informants. Now, I gotta tell you this. If you're a purist, and I was one then, once, now I'm prostituted, like everybody else. If you're a purist, and you're doing interpretive work, it's grounded theory. The theory is grounded in the data. So you propose the theory at the end of the paper, right? You don't see that very often, but if you're a purist, that's what you would do. Well, predictably enough, that's a surprise to the reviewers. That ain't right. Theory goes up front. And then you provide the data that supports the theory you've articulated. Why would you do it that way if it's a grounded theory? Hmm? Nonetheless, 
we're purists. We tried to explain it carefully to the reviewers why we were doing it this way. And we sent it back in with the same structure. A complete non-starter. The reviewers came back. Now, it looked like the authors of this paper, whom they did not know, of course, they looked like we knew what we were talking about. But damn it, you can't structure a paper like this. Fix it. Eh? <laughs> Put the theory up front, please. Now, I got to tell you a little story. I left myself another note. This reminds me of an episode from MASH. I'm dating myself again. But you know about the TV, the American TV series MASH? MASH, Mobile Army Surgical Hospital. It's a story about doctors ostensibly in the Korean War. Really, it was a metaphor for the Vietnam War, but that's a whole different story. There's this one scene where a sergeant carrying an automatic weapon brings his buddy into the MASH unit with a concussion. And he insists that his buddy be taken care of first. Now, Hawkeye Pierce, the main doctor, carefully explains to the sergeant that we're engaged in a process of triage, trying to decide who's the most seriously injured and therefore should be first into the OR, the operating room. And explains to him that I got head injuries here, I got open chest wounds. These people got to come first. And the sergeant with the automatic weapon nods his head and says, I understand, Doc, that's a pretty good explanation. Now, please take my buddy first. <laughs> and that's the way I felt with the reviewers. Yes, we get it. We understand. Now, please put the theory up front, would you? Because that's where it belongs. And uh, that was a little lesson in turning lemons into lemonade. Because ever since, if you read one of my studies, the theory's up front. So I'm a prostitute. But I carefully explain that it comes from the data you're going to read later. And these days, I'm even showing the grounded model up front. So sometimes it's what it takes to convince the reviewers. Um, I'm going to skip this one just in the interest of time. Now, um, let me make some overall observations. First of all, I still believe that qualitative research is underrepresented in our field. I'll give you some numbers on that in a second. And secondly, that it's difficult to publish, as no doubt, you know, and now, now, now my junior faculty colleagues and my doctoral students are saying, why don't you admit to people that your stuff gets rejected? So I'm here to tell you, I'm having a hard time lately. My stuff is getting rejected. So yeah, I'm preaching about a systematic methodology that might facilitate your conduct of research and presentation of evidence, but we all get rejected, including me, big time lately. And maybe it's because, never mind. <laughs> Nonetheless, it's still well worth doing. And given your project in life, if I could stereotype a collective like this, if you want to get at the kinds of things you're interested in, yes, there are ways to do it quantitatively. But qualitative is my chosen way to do it, and I think shared amongst quite a number of people here. Now, a, a little statistic before I get the hook. Um, I also want to make a case to you that qualitative research is what I would call low incidence, high impact. How do I know? I did a little legwork just within the last year. Here's what I did. I went to Administrative Science Quarterly and Academy of Management Journal. I went to them because they're the two papers, uh, the two journals that award either a yearly best paper, AMJ, or a scholarly contribution award. Um, in ASQ, the best paper written five years earlier, awarded six years after the fact. Okay, now that's pretty good evidence of a pretty good paper, right? If it we wins one of those awards. Then, and I did that back to 1991, I think. 
Then I looked at the same journals for the number of qualitative research papers, not theory papers, of course, research papers. What I found was only about 13% of all the papers published in those two journals in the last 25 years were qualitative. But when I looked at the award winners from the same journals from the same year, 48% were the award winners. What's that tell you? Low incidence, high impact. I would have a hard time standing here saying, you ought to follow my lead. Probably not a wise thing to do if you don't have tenure yet. Because the average time to publication from inception to publication for one of my works is more than five years. So if you want to have impact, I'm here to tell you, go qualitative. If you want to get tenure, mm, <laughs> maybe you do something else. Um, I'll tell you what. I'm. Um, You about ready? Uh, sure, whenever. <laughs> oh, right. Anne's having a good time too. Um, I had uh, I had made three proposals for SAP work, which I I have since concluded is pretentious. Let me just mention them. Um, you know, given what we do, I don't think our work is as good as it ought to be in being prescriptive. And, and I might be wrong about this. This may be in part attributable to my own ignorance in not reading enough SAP flagged work. Um, but given that we study what managers actually do, wouldn't it be reasonable to say, here are more, more or less effective practices or processes? I don't see enough of that. Uh, it kind of reminds me of, um, I left myself a little note here, where is it? Um, of the uh, procedure of, you remember the, the thing everybody in our field knows about Herb Simon's work about bounded rationality? You feel like dwarfs when you, when you read Simon's work on that. Oh, the universe, especially the informational universe is so huge that we minuscule humans could not possibly process all the information to make uh, an optimal, let alone a maximal decision. So give up, walk away. I don't think so, because if you read further, you discover that he actually had something to say about process. He talked about procedural, read it, process rationality. Eh? We might not be able to grasp all that stuff, but we can engage what we do, the procedures, the processes that we use, to do better. So I, I would argue for that. Um, I guess if I'm going to shoot my mouth off uh, in an article um, in AMR called, uh, what was it called? Uh, building Theory About Theory Building. Uh, you know, if everybody wants a contribution to theory, then here's what we can say about making a contribution to theory, and everybody does these days. Um, then we should be more prescient. I'm disappointed in us, maybe as a former uh, industry guy. Um, have you noticed that most of the important stuff does not come out of academia? Oh, we're pretty good at working on it once it comes out. But if you look at the new ideas, they come out of industry. Why aren't we more prescient? And I'm going to point the finger at you. If you're studying what managers do, you're close to the bone. You should be able to figure out where this is going. So when you publish work, it ought to be prescient work, trying to predict where the trends are going to go. Um, and lastly, oh boy. Um, how do we conduct SAP work in an era of Trump? Where facts don't seem to matter. And the way that this is being carried out, vis-a-vis -vis climate change and a number of other things, it's an affront not only to the physical but also to the social sciences. I wonder what our stance ought to be. 
I saw a very impassioned statement by uh, Henrik Greve uh, at the ASQ meeting yesterday where he said, look, I'm only coming to Atlanta because I'm the editor of ASQ. But I come from a place, he's hanging out in Singapore now, I come from a place where a third of the population is Muslim. Why would I want to come to the U.S. under this kind of a regime? Now, that's one issue. The other issue, how about this regime's attitude towards science, even social science or organizational science? That's who we are, folks. So it's important to resist, and um, you should forgive me for being political as my parting shot, but let me make that parting shot. Uh, mm -hmm.